You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grain Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is former Indiana Supreme Court Justice Ted Bohm. And if you've listened to this podcast, you will have heard his name many times mentioned by some of the best people, the people who have made a difference. And the words are impactful, honest, concerned, involved, and amazing. I don't know that I've ever solicited stories about a guest who I don't know and and I've met Justice Bohm just a few times um, and had people come back with the adjectives like they've used for him. Ted, thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, happy to do it. Uh, the best thing about uh, Justice Bohm that we're going to find out very soon is he's an IPS kid. Absolutely. He graduated from Short Ridge in 1956. Uh, were there some other luminaries with you? at Shortridge? Well, the, the most well-known name in our class was Dan Burton. Oh, and you're kidding. No, there, there are 512 people in my class. And if you tried to list the 500 most likely to end up in the House of Representatives, <laughs> he probably wouldn't have been on it. But <laughs> How close were you? You know, he actually lived in the Guardian's home in Irvington when he was a kid. And I grew up right across the street from it. I, 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 I don't know. If... A little bit of, I mean, I knew Dan. He was a great golfer. It was his uh, uh, brand in, in high school. The uh, Shortridge team won the state championships uh, our senior year, shooting a collective 280. That means <laughs> <laughs> team average two under par. How far away were you from... Um... You're exactly my, my dad's past, but you're exactly, excuse me, my mom has passed. You're exactly my mom's age. She's born in 1938. How close were you to Senator Luger? He was, f he was five years ahead of me at Shortridge, I think, or four. I, his sister was uh, a year behind me. Uh, I knew her. I, I only knew Dick by reputation at that time. I got to know him shortly after he came back to Indianapolis from the Navy. How close were you to a fellow we've had on the podcast, and maybe you knew him then, maybe you didn't, and that is uh, Dick Hall, the kidnapped victim of Tony Caritzas. Oh, I knew him because he was the starting quarterback on the Shortridge football team when I was a freshman, and, and I was a, a student manager as a freshman. I retired from that job after that. But. <laughs> He came on the podcast uh, and was absolutely terrific. Uh, as I was nine when the kidnapping happened, but I didn't know he was a Shortridge grad until we actually sat down. What did he you was, just? He was a you know, a, as high school kids go, a major figure at, at Shortridge and when he was still in school. So we're just jumping ahead a little bit. We try to do this somewhat chronologically just to satisfy my sense of being a history nerd, but it's night, it's February, 1970, not 77, 77. Yeah. He gets kidnapped by crit. Just were you like, Oh my God, I know that guy. Yeah. I, I, I hadn't th thought much about him from the time he graduated from short region until then, but I did certainly recognize him. You went to Brown university after graduating from Shortridge. Uh, we've had some Ivy League folks on this uh, podcast, uh, Mitch Daniels being one and uh, David Frick being another. 
and I'm sure there'll be more to come. What made you decide to go to Brown of all places and then Harvard Law School? Well, uh, I went to, I ended up at Brown because uh, Bill Dyer, who was the, uh, I guess his title was president of Indianapolis Newspapers, Inc. He was the, the oh, yeah. business leader uh, of, the, of the Star and News for, from 1946 until he retired sometime in the early 90s, I think but for 40 years or more. Uh, and uh, he and my father, he, he and his wife and my parents were best friends. They vacationed together. I, he was the closest thing to an uncle that I had, uh, having no, no biological aunts and uncles. And he went to Brown. So, so I went to Brown. <laughs> 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 no, no IU, no Notre Dame. I mean, do you have other, I'm sure you had lots of opportunities. What made you decide to just go someplace completely different? Well, uh, my mother had gone to Smith, which was another yeah. so-called seven sisters school. And so I, and my father is a German immigrant. He, he was class of Munich 22. That's another story, but um, it's, uh, so I've sort of, grew up a little bit with the idea of going east to school. Well, correct me on my history here. Of course, you mentioned that Munich 22. So when did Adolf Hitler try the beer hall putsch? 33. 33. So that was yeah, somewhat. Dad was already a U.S. citizen by 28. Uh, so he really didn't have anything to do with it. But he, he, was, he, got, he was in the First World War on the German side. As a kid, he was 16 when he was drafted. He was 18 when the war ended. And he ended up walking home from the front in France. Uh, they just said, okay, the war's over, go home. So he walked back to Offenbach, a suburb of Frankfurt where his family lived and went to the University of Munich. And when he got out, his family uh, gave him a trip around the world. They were successful manufacturers at that time since gone bankrupt, but that's another story. But he, he, uh, he got to the United States and decided he liked it and, uh, and stayed, became a U.S. citizen in 28. So he was drafted in World War I, so he participated in the Western, on the Western Front? Yes. And so did he... He was in the artillery. He wasn't actually, you know, he was behind the lines lobbing shells at the Brits. And, and what did he think? Did he get, have much contact with Americans then? Um, World War One is one of my favorite uh, eras. And at the end, it's called Operation Michael, where Ludendorff tries to end the war before the Americans can come over in, in greater numbers. But one of the things that I've read multiple times is how the sight of the Americans, just the fact that they were bigger, they were healthier, because they, quite frankly, hadn't been fighting for years, really demoralized the German soldiers. Like, we can't defeat these supermen. Look at these guys. Well, he was in the artillery behind the lines. He never saw, except, uh, except uh, if somebody flew over, uh, uh, if an American air, airman flew over and tried to drop a bomb on them or something, that, that's the closest he came to dealing with any of the... Uh, allied troops how was he when he came over to the united states did he settle here first or did he kind of matriculate over here no he was in chicago uh and um, he met my wife up in northern michigan when his roommate his his roommate's family had a place a place called northport michigan and my mother at that time his family uh, shared it with with his roommate's father. And uh, so they were both up there and met in Northern Michigan uh, in a summer vacation for both of them. And then they, when the war, he was working in Chicago uh, in the travel business. He spoke French and German and English. And, oh, yeah. And uh, was able, and was in the business of taking people on world tours, essentially. Uh, but the torpedoes became a problem beginning in 39 with that business. And he was looking for a job and mother had some connections here. So they moved back to Indianapolis. 
how is he treated as a, as a former soul, you know, artillery man, but member of the Imperial German army? Did he feel like he was treated fairly that it was bygones and bygones? Oh yeah. I mean, he, he was a kid, you know, he was, he was eight, 16 when he was drafted. He was 18 when he walked home from the war and, and went to school started his university after as a veteran if you will mm -hmm. but you know they were throwing children into the war at that point and he was one of them but he he he, uh, he was a, a very outgoing friendly guy and he got along fine immediately and that and he he had zero hostility as a result of the war i mean he was he was a victim of the war the same as a lot of other people you know He's on the wrong side, but. And so what do you, I mean, you were born in 38, so I'm, I'm going to guess you can remember the end of World War II. I do. Uh, I remember VJ Day very well because my mother slammed on the brakes going down to the parade and threw me, and we didn't have seatbelts in those days. I was, <laughs> not, <laughs> and I was six years old and I went crashing into the, the, the 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 window and uh, the windshield of the car and then went to the see the vj parade with a big bump on my head <laughs> did 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 your father as as a german family in america during world war ii did they feel like i'm mean, not gonna say i don't want to say do they feel as american or as anyone else but were they like look these are our people now and we're americans are fighting for freedom and hitler's an abomination and we got to do something well my on my mother's side i'm a mayflower descendant so i'm kind of a mutt here i mean I'm, it wasn't a german family that my mother didn't speak a word of german so i you know it's never spoken in the house and it really wasn't part of the culture i mean i grew up as an american kid When you went to Harvard Law School, was that something that was a culmination of a plan? Like you've always wanted to be an attorney or did these opportunities kind of come to you segmented? Uh, I had thought about a career in law as, uh, as early as you had to write an occupational paper at, at Shortridge in the, as a, I think it was a sophomore year project or, uh, and I did write it about lawyers and went down and interviewed a friend of my father who was a lawyer at the time and uh but i didn't really have any goal i it, i went to law school mostly because i didn't know what else to do when i got out of college <laughs> and when did you i think i'm guessing he's younger than you uh, a, a former or excuse me a previous podcast guest david frick graduated from harvard did you know him back in the day or is that? Well, I, I, I became the person who interviewed at Harvard for Baker and Daniels uh, by the um, late 60s or even before that. And um, so I met David when he was still a law student. He was six years after me at Harvard. And, and for those of you who are listening to this podcast, uh, and you want to go back and listen to a previous podcast, uh, I highly, it's Chris Spangle's favorite, I think, or at least in the Mount Rushmore, and that is the podcast we did with former deputy mayor for uh, Bill Hudnut, uh, David Frick, and it's deputy mayor Frick who suggested many, many times that uh, Justice Bohm would be a terrific podcast guest. Uh, when, you, when you interviewed him, did you have any inkling it was going to be the start of what I believe is a 50 year friendship? No, I mean, obviously we, we, we do, we're still friends. We still have our Pacers season tickets seats next to each other today. Um, but uh, obviously, you know, he was, he was one of many people we were trying to recruit over those years. You were at Harvard, or had just left Harvard, uh, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Do you remember that day, and what was it like to be around that area, or at least just to to acknowledge what happened? Well, I was by that by the, uh, November of '63. I was a law clerk at the U.S. Supreme Court. Just started 
that job. And I certainly remember it I mean, vividly. I was at the, at the court and at the, in those days, the, the, the court, Supreme Court building was pretty much wide open to the public. And, um, so, and you could pretty much walk into almost any place in the court if you wanted to. And if you were a clerk, you had access to the chambers behind. And there was only one television set in the entire building. It was in Justice Brennan's office. So when the word got out uh, shortly after 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, uh, everybody gathered in Justice Brennan's office. But it was a Friday afternoon late, and a lot of the justices had already gone somewhere for the weekend. And uh, so only White and Goldberg were uh, still at the court. They were the two people who were appointed by President Kennedy. So it was kind of a, yeah. and, and of course there were a lot of other people there too at that time. I mean, there were, uh, but, but at that time there were only 19 clerks at the whole court. Now there are over 40 of uh, staff in the place. But. Were you there? Did you file through the rotunda or, or see the funeral procession? Yeah, well, uh, we had already made arrangements for that weekend to meet my college roommate who was from Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, but his family had a home at Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. We were gonna meet them at Rehoboth Beach uh, that weekend. And so we drove over, it's about a three hour drive and sat there like everybody else in America, staring at the television set as Jack Ruby was shot. And, uh, and so then we, my first wife and I decided we got to go back to the rotunda and we did. We went back and we, at that point we had my first daughter, Lisa was already born. She was a small, you know, you, you carried her around, but sure. she, and uh, she, she went through the rotunda with us. We stood in line. And, uh, that's, did, I mean, it was get, horrible. Did you get to meet many of the folks uh, I mean, you're throwing some names out here, and, and the podcast audience may know some of them. Uh, Byron uh, Wizard White was the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, you mentioned uh, Brennan, who I think was appointed by Eisenhower. That's correct. William Brennan. Um, and then you... Uh, Arthur Goldberg was the other Kennedy appointee. He later became ambassador to the UN. He were, uh, did, you, did you get to become friends with people in the Kennedy administration just just because you're in DC at the same time did you like Robert Kennedy did you get to meet him and the president and those sorts of folks I did uh, the, the 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 Supreme Court clerks had a tradition which I think they still do today of inviting people to come over and have lunch with them and there were only 19 of us so it was a relatively small group and Robert Kennedy was one of them that came Dean Acheson we had some pretty <laughs> pretty yeah. impressive guests. There were several prominent people in the Kennedy administration. Burt Marshall, who was the head of the Civil Rights Division at that time, came. And Dean Atchison was Secretary of State, I think, under Truman. Is that right? That's right. And, you know, and, and was still a major player uh, right. in world diplomacy as a sort of special envoy. Well, and if, if you read any books in the movie too, 13 Days, but if you read any books about the Cuban Missile Tri Crisis, you realize how important Dean Acheson was to how it all turned out. I, I think that's right. I mean, he was a, he, he was a, a, a guy, a, a go-to guy, I think, uh, even for Republican administrations and to some extent intervening between Truman and and Kennedy. Well, well, Nixon, who savaged him, Richard Nixon, when he ran for the Senate in 1950, coward was a Dean Acheson's cowardly containment college of communism or something <laughs> like that. I'm close. I don't have it exactly right. But even Nixon reached out to him when he was president and wanted to pick his brain. That's what I understood. I mean, you were a law clerk for Chief Justice Earl Warren. Correct. What was that like? And, and I just couldn't even imagine being your age. I'm assuming right out of law school. Uh, 
or close to it, and that's the assignment you get. Intimidating, exhilarating, all the above? Yes. I mean, it was a fabulous job. I loved it, I, as everybody does. I mean, it's something any, any law student would, would, would like to do if you could. And it is a fascinating job. I, our experience was a little bit different because it was the year of the Kennedy assassination. So the chief, is that's what we called him, <laughs> uh, after January, John, President Johnson asked him to head up the Warren Commission to investigate the assassination. And that took him somewhat out of the normal course of uh, the court's flow. So he wrote fewer opinions that year, although he wrote some very big ones, including certainly one of the most important decisions in the history of the court, the one person, one vote uh, decision in Reynolds versus Sims that uh, changed the political structure of America uh, because it forced uh, redistricting to be done on a basically one person, one vote. And to take Indiana, for example, in the, the 1960 election, we had the district that uh, Andy Jacobs would run in in 64 was Marion County essentially it was five times the size of the district in the southeastern part of the straight state that uh, that it, because we hadn't redistricted since 1920 and all the population mm -hmm. shifts all the growth of, of the suburbs around indianapolis had occurred since then creating vast dis disparities in the population and reynolds versus sim forced that all to be corrected by legislative action and it, it changed the political map of America. Courts are, are sometimes known, maybe usually known as um, they're named after uh, the Chief Justice, the Warren Court, the Burger Court, that sort of thing. Uh, where would you put, uh, I once had a discussion with Mitch Daniels and we were chatting about the five, or excuse me, the, yes, the five most impactful people who have never been president. So you could say George Marshall, General of the Army and Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Martin Luther King. Uh, in that discussion, we mentioned John Marshall, who I think was appointed Chief Justice by John Adams, but famously in um, Marbury versus Madison established the principle of the court declaring laws unconstitutional. Where would you put the Warren Court in that historical panoply of 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 court, Supreme Courts throughout our history? Well, it's got to be up there. I mean, they, they created uh, modern America in many ways. The, the Brown against the board, the school tea segregation was, uh, if you want to talk about an impactful decision, that was an impactful decision. Well, and you have, uh, uh, the Miranda decision, and I mean, I mean, it's too yeah. many to count. Uh, well, yeah, there are a whole lot of, of, of criminal law decisions, but I, I, in terms of things that actually shaped history, Brown against the board dwarfs almost anything as a Supreme Court decision. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today is former Supreme Court, Indiana Supreme Court Justice Ted Bohm, who's done a heck of a lot more than that, and we're about ready to talk about it. But let me ask you real quick, Ted, is there a Hoosier leader and or legend you particularly admire? Well, that, that is a, a big one. Uh, I... I you mentioned Jim Morris a few minutes ago when we were talking. Do you well, Jim Morris, it, it, there's nobody who's done what Jim Morris has done to shape the Indianapolis we have today out of the nap town we had in 1975. Uh, he's done it on so many fronts and by 
influencing so many other people to get active in it and and pull them together uh, that uh, I mean he's a, a giant on our local scene without any question in we were just discussing you know, the fact that you clerked for Chief Justice Earl Warren. Uh, let me ask you a question which you may not be able to answer, but hopefully at least uh, elicits a chuckle. As someone who knew the Chief Justice, what do you think was going through his mind as he was administering the oath of office to Richard Nixon in January? He didn't like Nixon. <laughs> That's why I ask. <laughs> and uh, he... He would take us, his clerks, to lunch on Saturdays often. We work Saturdays, but we'd stop around two or so and go to lunch at a place that no longer exists called the National Lawyers Club. And that might be a two-hour lunch, and you get into all sorts of stories. And he, he was pretty tact. He wasn't too open with us, but it's, he clearly didn't like Nixon. And then, ironically, when he died... The, he, the funeral was in the National Cathedral in, in Washington. And I, as a law clerk, was along with another 30 or so of us at that time, uh, were right behind the family who was right behind Richard Nixon, who was in the front row. <laughs> and I just thought, what an irony that the front row, and, and there's Mrs. Warren with Richard Nixon. And I, I just, couldn't get it. The, the well, guy who spoke, by the way, is a fellow who married me in the first my wedding, the first who? wife. It, well, his name was. Uh, he's an Episcopal minister uh, in my wife's church. She she was from Washington D.C. And I'm sorry, I can't give his name. Is Glenn was his last name? Can't give you his first. But I've I've only met him twice when he married me and then he spoke at the chief's funeral. <laughs> is it? Is it something before we get you, we bring you back to Indianapolis, but is it, is it something that you, you know, you exchange letters with people like, you know, a, a Brennan or a chief justice Warren, or is it more of like you stay in contact with your fellow clerks? And one of the questions I asked David Frick, and I want to make sure that I ask you as well, because Harvard is, you know, a singularly prestigious university and that is, you know, was there anyone, quote unquote, famous at Harvard when you were there? Uh, David Frick, I think, was told us he was a couple years ahead of current United States Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. Yeah, I, I knew Steve Breyer. He was a year behind me. He's he's, uh, he's actually a year older than I, but he uh, he spent two years as a Marshall Fellow in England. And so I, I lapped him. I guess he's only a year older than I. Um, uh, but he, so he was in the second year when I was in the third year and we were both on the Harvard Law Review together. So I got to know him reasonably well. Um, he's a very nice fellow, by the way. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, other people who were around me were mostly people who had distinguished judicial careers. Pierre Laval, in, in, who's a very highly regarded judge on this second circuit in New York City for many years. I mean, second federal circuit court uh, was a very good friend of mine and still we still occasionally see each other. In 1964, you come back to Indianapolis to join the law firm of Baker and Daniels, which means if my math is correct, you were here during 1968 and Robert Kennedy's run for the presidency. Were you involved? What did you think of that? And, and did you know our friend, our great friend of the podcast, who was a terrific interview? And that is Mike Riley, who ran Robert Kennedy's campaign in this state. Well, the answer to the question is yes and yes. <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I did get involved in the, in the Robert Kennedy campaign very actively, although my role and I knew Mike uh, from, from that connection. Um, and we, we worked together quite closely on a couple of legal problems that, that if you had, I got a sort of a complicated story if you want it later about Judge Niblack, but uh, who was a local uh, circuit judge at the time. But uh, 
I did uh, work with, uh, with the Kennedy campaign quite a bit. Mostly what I did was doing the advance work for, when, for whenever they go, wherever they went. And Indiana primary was a major battleground. It was the first white bread Midwestern state that Robert Kennedy was going to run in. And it was from, a, it was thought as a strategic matter to be important that they did well here, which they did. But my job was to get the local color. So whenever they went to Michigan City, I, I tell them, well, Don Larson's from Michigan City. And, oh. and uh, it, if you're not a baseball fan, Don Larson pitched a perfect no-hitter game in the World Series in, uh, in 1957. Uh, and everybody in Michigan City knows that. Uh, so that's something he, he, that Senator Kennedy would throw into his speech. And, and you know, we, so I, because Baker and Daniels knew lawyers all over the state and was a major law firm then, just like it is today, one of the three biggest firms in the state, they had usually have relationships with county seat lawyers all over the place. So I'd get local color from them and feed it to the campaign. And then, so I was there the night of Kennedy's speech. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, it was brought to my attention that you were there and at uh, the park in on just north of downtown where Robert Kennedy uh, gave his famous speech. Uh, what was that like? And and I'm going to say that I ask this question because you should ask these questions of, of things that have become mythological. Um, but do you, do you agree with the sentiment that Senator Kennedy's speech that night changed Indianapolis history? I think it, it certainly affected it uh, because it, it was peaceful. And, and we were almost the only city of any size with any significant African-American population that didn't have any significant civil disturbances that night. Um, and you have to think that there's some causal relationship there. And when he made the announcement, it was very clear, I think, that many people didn't know it until he told them. That's right. I mean, an audible gasp went up. Uh, from the crowd collectively. Um, and then there was complete silence and order and everybody left without any disturbance or up. And the crowd was, you know, it was pretty dark by the time he made that speech. But so it's a little hard to tell, but it, it was pretty clearly a predominantly African-American crowd, but, and maybe even overwhelmingly, but certainly, majority but uh, did where we discussed where you were when john f kennedy was assassinated where were you and tell us your memories of hearing about the assassination of robert f kennedy and we try not to date these podcasts because they are not um, broadcast and posted in the order in which they are recorded but today is june 5th the anniversary of his assassination yeah, I, well, I was like a lot of people watching on television when it happened. I mean, I, I was closely following the campaign. I thought he was going to win, and I thought and still think uh, he would have uh, been elected if he, if he had survived. Um, and it was a California primary, though. It was a critical step in 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 the process of getting the nomination so uh, having worked in the campaign and followed the the intervening roughly a month um or two months i guess from from april to uh june you know it's almost exactly two months um w avidly <laughs> uh, and closely following it, I was pasted to the television set and saw this, saw these events as the world saw them. But I, I was sitting in my living room. I wasn't out anywhere. Well, we've, we've, with, with your generation and, and me being 
my graduate degree is in medieval history and 1968 isn't that long, isn't hundred years away, but it is about, you know, it's 50 years away. And to talk to folks in your generation about the impact that year had on them politically, socially, and in terms of, of how they perceived the country. Uh, our good friend, Terry Curry, uh, former Marion County prosecutor, who we're rooting for very, very hard these days. Uh, he shaved his self, so he was clean, shaved his beard. He was clean for Gene, because that's who he supported in 1968, uh, Senator Eugene McCarthy. And then in our podcast we did with someone I'm guessing you know really well, and that's Michael Browning. He was at Notre Dame for the speech that Robert Kennedy gave, his first big speech uh, as part of the Indiana primary that really kind of launched his effort in the state. And not only was Michael there, but Michael was the one who procured the car that Robert Kennedy rode in throughout the Notre Dame campus. <laughs> and, and he said the car was so damaged from people trying to get a, you know, a touch in Robert Kennedy. He goes, um, I, he wasn't sure if the dealership was going to take the car back. <laughs> but these are the conversations we want to have on the podcast. And, and would you say that it's that the Kennedy family helped shape or did a lot to shape your view of politics, your view of the United States, your sense of opportunity? I think so. I mean, my mother was a Republican precinct committeeman growing up, and I, I considered myself a Republican in high school, although I didn't. I mean, I grew up in the Eisenhower years. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'd say definitely the Kennedy uh, administration affected my my views considerably and, and um, certainly Robert Kennedy I uh, thought had a chance to pull us out of what I uh, almost everybody viewed as a terrible situation in 1968 both domestically and for for foreign uh, relations when I mean, the Vietnam War was highly controversial and, and uh, by 1968, a lot of people had come around to a view that I had held for several, for a couple of years before that, that we had no business being there, but how to get out uh, was a major issue. And, and of course, both whether you were clean for Gene as Terry was, or, <laughs> or one of the few uh, as lawyers with an establishment firm who would support Robert Kennedy as I was, um, he felt strongly that we needed to change the course of the country. And that year was certainly pivotal in so many ways. Uh, but we, we got through it. It was a slum of a year, though. I mean, it was nightmarish for everybody. History is repeating itself. And well, that's, that is it. Let's hope not as severely, uh, but you're right. Okay. After joining Baker and Daniels, uh, Ted Bohm uh, was a partner, then he was managing partner. He had a career as general counsel for General Electric and Eli Lilly. But we want to talk about a couple of things that have, have uh, come up in the podcast directly or indirectly and get your thoughts. Because uh, we had Ryan Vaughn, who's the president of the Indiana Sports Corporation. He was a podcast guest. And through talking to him and people like Bill Benner, a podcast guest, Mark Miles, podcast guest, and others, and Allison Melangdon, who was also president of the Sports Corp, it really has come home to me in a way that I never really understood, quite frankly, even when I was in Mayor Ballard's office, how critical and how important the Sports Corporation has been to the development of this city. What was your role in starting it, and would you agree that it's been dispositive? Uh, well, how I got into it was um, by the late 70s, uh, a group that basically Jim Morris and Dave Frick assembled when Dave was still a deputy mayor and Jim was a rising executive, but not yet a top person at Lilly Endowment. The two of them were... Uh, largely the engineers of 
the HUD Nut administration and the programs of the Lilly Endowment, at least as perceived from the outside. Uh, and they were both young guys, as you know, and, and th they gradually just began drawing together the, what became a much more expansive group of people. And Jim largely was the person who was a catalyst, but I think it was Dave Frick who brought me into it uh, to just how do we, what are we going to do to make Indianapolis a better place? And we had meetings beginning shortly after Hudnut was mayor, uh, initially with not very many people at all, talking about things like some things we're still talking about today, like how do we get more nonstop air service <laughs> to <laughs> major, other major cities. And, and But a major issue was how do we put Indianapolis on the map and how do we uh, in, generally energize the place. And one obvious way uh, to, to appeal to, every, to a lot of us was, let's get an NFL franchise. How are we gonna do that, <laughs> among other things? So, uh, and then as we're worrying through that, we had the Sports Act of 1978 that all of a sudden said, you're gonna to have to have a separate national governing body for each of the sports that we compete in the Olympics and the Pan Am games in. It's federal legislation. That's federal legislation. Uh, and so what, at, at, prior to that, the AAU, which is headquartered here in Indianapolis, had been the, if, if you wanna think of it this way, had been the US franchisee of the, and, International Olympic Committee. And it, it organized the teams in, I think, 20 some sports, certainly track and field, and boxing, and swimming, were, were all AAU sports. Uh, all of a sudden, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have to have a new entity governing each of these sports separately. Well, Indianapolis had no prospect of getting an, an, an immediate NFL team at that time, it, was, it would have to be an expansion team. Bob Welsh, Michael Browning's first boss, was in the process of trying to woo uh, the, the NFL to position him to be the organizer of an Indianapolis franchisee if and when expansion came. And if events had gone differently, I think we might well have gotten that in 1987, was it when Jacksonville ultimately was uh, came into the NFL. Yeah, the, the late, uh, well, one of the things that's been told, and I think that David Frick said this in the podcast we did with him, was when the Colts came here, it was a time of franchises moving, Los Angeles to St. Louis, Oakland to uh, Los Angeles, and they knew the Colts were looking. Uh, that is, it, it, that became true in 1983, I think. It wasn't true in the 70s when we were, we were starting to talk about this. Uh, it, was, it was, I mean, I was, I was speaking to the late 70s and, and that's how the Sports Corp got born, was let's seize this opportunity. Uh, all of a sudden we're gonna have 37 new entities where they're gonna have boards of directors that are come from all over the country. By and many of them are somewhat prominent in various fields. I mean, from physicians to business leaders to just junkies on the sport, to whatever. Um, but it's it's a nice, clean, pollution-free industry, and it'll it'll get some attention from the press. Let's and we can get that done now instead of the long-term objective of NFL and the, and the very clear prospect that we're never going to have major league baseball in Indianapolis. Right. So, um, it, let me ask you a quick question. Then. If, if I had told you in 1979 that in 2012, the city of Indianapolis will not only host the Super Bowl in a brand new stadium, that is the second stadium built to host a football team 
not only would it host it, but it would completely redefine for an entire country what it means to be a host city. You would have said, no way. <laughs> yeah, well, that was that was beyond our wildest dreams at that point. I I wouldn't have told you we'd move the NCAA here either. I, but we did see it as an opportunity to put Indianapolis on the map uh, and make progress. And it, it also gave us the opportunity, if we could y use the, the amateur sports as a, as a vehicle to build an NFL ready, ready stadium, we'd at least have one of the building blocks in place to be an expansion team if as and when expansion came. So this was, I'm not giving you the thinking in the 70s, uh, but so the, then the question is, well, how are we going to do that? That's how the sports corporation got built. We decided, well, if we're going to do this, we want to introduce ourselves in a big way to the amateur sports world. So we came up with, let's do the sports festival in, in 1982. And we and so uh, I and several others went out to Colorado Springs. We didn't have any photographs of any buildings yet, but we had renderings. <laughs> 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 and and we're here's what we're going to do. We're going to have swimming. We're going to have track and field. We're going to we're going to have uh, this, that, and the other thing. And they looked at it, and and we had Jim Morris and Lily Endowment behind us which looked good to them. It looked like it was a, maybe a little bit more financially si uh, viable than most people who wanted to do things like this. And how uh, important was the national sports festival in 82? Because I'm getting ready to ask you about the Pan Am games in 87, another event, which quite frankly, I was clueless as to how important it was until we had our interview and then like my lunch conversations with Mark Miles. But 1982, the National Sports Festival, I was in eighth grade. I remember it. I don't remember it well. Is that a situation where Indianapolis proves, okay, we can do this? Take a look at us. Absolutely. It was our coming out party. And, it, and I think we, we did a, a pretty good job of strategizing how this would work. That what we wanted to do was get all the sports world together put on an event that's big enough to get national attention at some level and show them a hell of a good time. And it worked. Uh, basically, we pulled it off. And I think it was the seminal event in everything that's unfolded since, whether it's Pan Am Games, the NCAA, the Super Bowl, all these things evolved from a gradual building on that base. The 1987 Pan Am Games, and we're here with former Indiana Supreme Court Justice Ted Bohm, whose uh, career and efforts and energy and intellect has been woven and remains woven into the fabric, not only of Indianapolis, but also our entire state. Justice Bohm, we're talking about how sports, amateur sports, really started to propel Indianapolis in the early 80s. The Colts come in 83 if memory serves. And then in 1987, Indianapolis hosts the Pan Am Games, which has been mentioned by people like Mark Miles, Bill Benner, and others. Like that was a game changer for the city. Why do you think that was the case? And how difficult was it for Indianapolis to put on the Pan Am Games given the severely truncated schedule because of the fact that it was taken from one city and then given to us? Well, we couldn't have done it if we hadn't done the sports festival. What distinguished us from every other city in America except Los Angeles, which had done the 84 Olympics, mm -hmm. was that when it became obvious that the 1981 decision to, give, to hold the 87 Pan Am Games in Santiago, Chile, couldn't happen. The, 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 the political situation in Chile clearly precluded there being the host. But that only became clear uh, to, to everybody by in 1984, which meant 
you had to put together in two and a half years what other what what normally takes six years to assemble, and that means you've got to put the financing together, you got the you've got to have the facilities in place, and so on. And it, but only because we had done the sports festival, we already had venues for most of the sports in place right now. Very few other. Los Angeles could have done it, but nobody else. Uh, and Los Angeles, like everybody else, uh, was exhausted at that point. I mean, if, after you've done a major event like that, it tires the city out a little bit. I mean, you've really tapped your volunteer capacity to the brink. And we had a little bit of a hangover from the Pan Am Games as a result of that, uh, too. But when, when, by the time we had 36,000 or 38,000 people have used both numbers, uh, volunteers that, that you're tapping 10% of the adult population is engaged right. in somehow or another. But our, our podcast guest today, Ted Bohm was chairman and CEO of the organizing committee for the 1987 Pan American games here in Indianapolis. How did you get selected for that role? Well, uh, because I was president of the sports corp. I mean, it was, it was, we organized the Pan Am Games as a separate corporation called Paxi, uh, P-A-X-I for Pan American 10th Indianapolis. Uh, but that was simply a legal move so because we knew it was a financially risky and we didn't want to bankrupt the sports corporation if the Pan Am Games was financially insolvent. As it turned out, we managed to do the Pan Am Games on a break-even basis and with a $36 million budget, um, which was a lot of money in those days. Sure. Um, and um, the, well, the, uh, the net of it is we couldn't, have, we couldn't have done it if we hadn't done the sports corp. Uh, it had, first of all, if we didn't put, have in place the, the sports corp organization, in, in, but the, uh, the Pan Am Games or the, national sports festival structure was really pretty adaptable to the Pan Am games. There's a major additional dimension when you run an international event, but it's another whole layer of complexity on everything to, to, to house and feed and transport and care and feed for people who don't speak English and on and on. But uh, so let me ask you a question because of, let me give you an opportunity that doesn't happen very often on this podcast, but um, someone he, he's been on twice, once by himself, and then he came on with uh, Greg Ballard and with Mel Raines to discuss the effort to win the Super Bowl and then uh, successfully host the Super Bowl. But um, of all the people I've met in my adult life, uh, when it comes to pure talent and leadership, Mark Miles is at the top of the top. Here's your chance to give him an employee review because he was your executive director, for lack of a better term, for the Pan Am Games. Talk about Mark Miles' role in that and then how you, you know, 30 years later, 25 years later, watched the Super Bowl committee and how familiar it all was to you. Well, Mark uh, ended up being the leader of about a 300-person employed staff. That means we had 35,700 other people involved. They were the, the paid group that Mark led was less than 1% of the people who were engaged in staging the Pan Am Games, but they were the critical 1%. And, and he, uh, Mark did just a marvelous job and he was not that experienced in administering anything at that point. I mean, but we did have a number of people in our volunteer group who were by that time somewhat experienced managers in various enterprises, large and small throughout central Indiana. Uh, and they did contribute significantly to the overall leadership of the, of the operation. But the staff uh, had to do an awful lot of the legwork the full time. And, and you haven't mentioned Sandy Knapp, but, Sandy uh, was, we stumbled into Sandy, whose experience was as, as a uh, 
public relations person basically for the Pacers uh, when we hired her on as the first employee of the sports corporation. And, and when we did this, the sports festival, Sandy and two other people were the only employees, Sandy and her <laughs> assistant, <laughs> Sue Ross, and one other fellow, my case, were the entire paid staff that uh, put on the sports festival. Everything else was all volunteers. So when you were looking at the Super Bowl committee and, and Mark Miles had your role in the Super Bowl committee that you had for the Pan Am Games, Allison Melangdon, who's a podcast guest of ours as well, she had Mark Miles's role. So when you look back at that, how much, and I say this in a nice way, how much pride did you have, not only in Mark, not only in Allison and, and their staff, but in the city itself for what happened during that Super Bowl period? Oh, it's terrific. And, you know, and, and I, I just add for, for old time's sake, I got uh, all the, all the, garb of, of an organizer, member of the organizing committee, but I hardly did anything uh, to, to help the Super Bowl effort. It was all done by people uh, who had grown up in some of the stuff that I was involved with, but had long since surpassed anything we'd done. Do you have a favorite Pan Am Games experience or memory? <laughs> There are a bunch of them. Uh, one of them was at the opening ceremonies uh, where President Bush, George H.W. Bush, uh, came as vice president of the United States at that time uh, to open the games. And the, you've probably heard this story. The Secret Service at the last minute changed the gate that he, was, that he and his entourage were to go in and opened up another one and closed the gate that all the that that uh, thousands of people were trying to get in through, so many many of the people who had bought tickets to the opening ceremonies were late to get to their seats because they had to then walk all the way down to the next gate. So uh, George H. W. and and Barbara uh, get in and then we're in the, in the presidential box with, and they're already there before. Uh, Peggy, my wife and I get there all adorned in my red jacket and uh, the official uniform of the stuff. And so I get in there and get into the, the, the presidential box. Uh, and Barbara Bush looks at me and she says, who are you? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> I had to explain, well, you know, I'm, I'm the guy who's running this show. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, In a minute, you'll see me speak up there on that stage. <laughs> and she said, I, and that was it. That was, that was my conversation with Barbara Bush. <laughs> How many presidents have you met? Um, well, uh, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton. Um, I, I guess I mean, shaking their hand, I guess, is how you meet a president, right? It's not like you're sitting around chilling. Yeah, I, I chatted a little bit with uh, Bill Clinton. I've, I've spent more time with losing Democratic candidates than I have with <laughs> time Walter with Mondale, George McGovern, Hubert Walter, Humphrey. Walter Mondale, George McGovern, and Michael Dukakis are all people I've spent some time with. Al Gore, he went to Harvard. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know him. He, I didn't know him from Harvard, but I, I mean, he's an undergraduate. Anyway, I'm just a law school guy. That doesn't really make you a Harvard man. I'm still, I'm still a Vernonian at heart. <laughs> we should also mention the Super Bowl committee with people like Tony Mason and Susan Boffman and Diana Boyce. And the numbers are too many. You just can't go on and on. But the one thing that's come through in our conversations about Indianapolis and these events and the transformational nature of them is the spirit of volunteerism talk about that for just a second like when Indianapolis sounds the toxin people come running well I think that's the sports corporation's biggest contribution uh, and it, it's manifested itself in all sorts of places outside the direct fairway of sports uh, I, 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 the line I've used from time to time is we uh, 
have have all sorts of things that are, that uh, have sprung up because people said, "Well, we can do this." Mm-hmm. We have, we wouldn't have had a violin competition if we hadn't done the sports festival. <laughs> I think right, right. I, that pe- uh, other people who have interests far from sports as their principal focus think, "Well, wait a minute, we can do things in a first class manner here in Indianapolis," and they then proceed to go ahead and do it with the same can-do mentality. Uh, and it's, and because it's worked, it's replicated itself and it's got people enthusiastic and we to the, today still have uh, enormous turnouts uh, for, well, the Super Bowl, obviously it's a classic example, but the, 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 not, not just the national headliner events, but all sorts of lesser things produce the same results. And uh, I, I think that's great. I mean, whatever turns people on, whether it's their school or their church or a, or a, a community event like, uh, a, like a major one or a small one, it's all worth doing and it's all gratifying and it's all satisfying for the people who participate in it. In August 1996, You accepted an appointment to the Indiana Supreme Court by then Governor Evan Bayh. Quick questions. Were you close to the Bayh family, including uh, Senator Birch Bayh? I wouldn't say I was close. I've known him and and supported him uh, when he was running and and, and have had and worked with him on several things, but I, I would, I was not part of his inner circle. I would. Were, what made you accept this appointment? And uh, B, did you have fun? Uh, well, I, it, it, it was the last thing I thought of as a career path. <laughs> but um, when Roger De Bruyler, who was retiring after 30 years on the court, whoever it was, 28, I think. Um, uh, it, uh, the governor had to appoint somebody and Matt Goodwine, who now heads up Help and Hospital Corp. A good man. Uh, yes. Uh, Matt was then uh, governor, governor Bice, uh chief of staff. And he and the governor asked him to, to to, uh, well, what do we do about this? And Matt said, well, what about Ted Bohm? <laughs> so <laughs> at that time, my wife, Peggy, was the head of this, what was then called the state tax board. It was a, it's, uh, the thing that reviewed all, all the property tax disputes in the state and also reviewed the budgets of local municipalities. It's since been consolidated into the finance authority uh, as a part of the finance authority. But th- she was the chair of the tax board and of course working with Matt in that capacity. And um, Matt had known me from Baker and Daniels days when he started right. out there as a young lawyer. And so Matt asked Peggy, would Ted be interested in being a Supreme Court justice? <laughs> and I, she said, I don't know, I'll ask him. So she did. <laughs> And I thought about it and I thought, well, I've always had a public service band, I, I, uh, but uh, as somebody who basically was uh, more aligned with the Democrats than the Republicans, uh, I, there wasn't much of an opportunity in, the, in Indiana for, for in that realm, uh, but that, there was plenty of civic opportunity and that's the path I took. But then when I thought, well, why not? I mean, I, I mean, I, I was 57 at the time, rel- relatively old to be appointed to that job. And uh, in due course, there I was. And you had fun. Yeah, I found it, a, a really, I enjoyed it. I, the, the, we had an excellent court at that, I think. Um, and I think it, the, it got a fair amount of national recognition as that. And Chief uh, Justice Randy uh, Shepard uh, has a uh, terrific uh, reputation, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I think the entire court had and has a good a good reputation. Is constitutional law is that what you find most intellectually uh, stimulating, whether it's Indiana or United States? 
Well, I, I, that's a subject I find stimulating, but it, I've always been interested in in complex legal issues. Just uh, that's that's what I did for 25 years at Baker and Daniels was complex litigation, you know, securities and antitrust cases, that sort of thing. I watch Law and Order. Well, there you go. That's good enough. We had federal judge uh, Barker on and she scolded me nicely for my, <laughs> I asked her how many episodes of law and order I could, would be necessary, but before I could come argue in front of her court, she, <laughs> she didn't hold me in contempt, but she stared at me and laughed. I kind of took it to mean the same thing. <laughs> I reached out to Ted Bohm's friends uh, to get some information and some possible questions. So as we, wrap up the leaders and legends podcast. I'm going to ask him just a few before we get to the five questions. I'm supposed to ask you about your baseball glove. <laughs> well, I had this Richie Ashburn model and oh, uh, Phillies. Yes. And, uh, I, I, I don't know exactly when I got that, but I, it had to be, I, I was one of the stalwarts of the Baker and Daniels softball team, which had an undistinguished record, but <laughs> we, we, we were out there and, uh, and uh, my baseball, I, my, my Richie Ashburn glove got broken by a line drive by off the bat of then judge Jack Barney, if you may remember Jack. Uh, who was on the criminal bench for years uh, and and had been a pretty good athlete uh, at Shortridge High School four years ahead of me. Uh, and he, it, I went up to to catch this ball. I was playing short field at that time. We, you know, these ten player defenses, and nailed the ball. But my Richie Ashburn glove, then probably twenty years old or so broke and the ball went through the and Brooke took the web out of the glove. So I had got some shoestrings and sewed it back together and played with it for several years after that. That must be the story that whoever wants. <laughs> it's a pretty long story. Um, how many times have you went to work with different colored socks? I don't know, but it, I'm sure it happens. I, I, uh, I'm not known for my sartorial <laughs> splendor. One of the things that's come up in these podcasts, and I'll ask two more, the importance of Penrod as a well, cultural think, touchstone for this city. You were involved. You, I was, this is what I was told. Ted really invented the organizational model that grew out of the founding of Penrod. I, I don't think that's totally fair. I think some of my predecessors, I was president in 1974. That's a one year job that, that rotated around, uh, which was the seventh year uh, of, of Penrod. And it, by the, it's the first year we actually made any money. Uh, every year we built the crowd, but it had never been profitable. Uh, until 74 and uh, we but the the organizational model had been developed by some of my pre predecessors I think I it, it fine-tuned it a little bit and, and uh, upgraded it but basically uh, it was it was a, a, a group that uh, it was a it was a team effort and but Penrod and, is underrated do you think in terms of if you're listing the things that have changed modern Indianapolis or made a difference in a particular community, Penrod, and this is my ignorance, right? But Penrod is not usually on that list and should it be? Well, it's, I think it's, if you look at the, at the way it's, it's influence is not directly in the arts fair that it runs and some of the other things that they've done since. Uh, but but it, it it has had some direct activities like we created the economic club as that was just a little effort uh, when I was president of Penrod uh, to 
but it wasn't my idea. It was, it was the idea of, an, of John Medvekis, who was an, another one of the founding members of Penrod, who since moved to Philadelphia. Uh, but, but I was president, thought it was a good idea, and, and I and David Orr, uh, uh, at that time a young executive at, the, at Indiana Bell, just basically put that together just the, out of our hip pockets and and there have been some other s direct activities of Penrod since then. But the, the real significance of Penrod is the relationships that it built. That many of the people who staffed the, the sports festival and later the Pan Am Games were people whose first experience in putting on a major event was Penrod. Mm. And the same, we went back to the same people and, and, and said, okay, you handled security for for Penrod. Can you take on organizing the security branch of the organizing committee for the sports festival? And can and and th there are any number of names of some of them, many of them quite well known names in Indianapolis, um, even today. Who, who got their first start in anything charitable or, or community oriented at Penrod, but then went on to do all sorts of other things too. And certainly when it was my job as president uh, or as chairman of the organizing committee to, to organize the organizing committee and ask <laughs> on the various chairs, uh, I went back to m many people from whom I first worked with in Penrod and said, you proved your mettle before you want to take on a bigger task. And almost all of them said, yes. The last question before we get to the five questions is this, if you could give me a, an answer, cause it's an expansive topic with a lot of views on all sides or both sides, but to you, to Ted Bohm, how critical is it that we reform gerrymandering? Well, this, this is my life's work, and, and unfortunately, I'm a failure. Um, I mean, my first effort in this goes back uh, to the 80s when then minority leader of the Senate, Frank O'Bannon, and, and majority leader of the House, uh, Mike Phillips, asked me if I would take on a constitutional challenge to gerrymandering. And when, and I did that and we successfully got the first district court ruling that gerrymandering is unconstitutional in out of the Indianapolis Southern District of Indiana federal three judge court. Those cases go directly to the Supreme Court and there we ended up with a four, three, two decision where by a six, three decision, we succeeded in taking in, in arguing that gerrymandering is something the courts can challenge uh, by a 63 vote. That was the ruling in that case called uh, Davis versus Bandemer. And, but they said, you didn't prove enough and sent it. And so we didn't get the ultimate result we wanted. Since then, it's been litigated over and over again until last year when the Supreme Court closed, reversed that decision and closed down the federal courts by a five to four uh, decision written by Chief Justice Roberts in which the uh, conservative five out in the, the liberal four, putting the labels that are conventional on it, sure. um, uh, split in a strongly worded opinion both ways. Uh, and so it's a dead letter in the federal courts today, but I do think gerrymandering is the source. You know, I've got a 45 minute speech on this that you don't want to hear, but basically <laughs> it's not just a matter of political unfairness. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible practice because what it produces is polarized legislatures because the primaries drive are the only significant event in a gerrymandered district. And if 90% of your districts are gerrymandered, that means 90% of your districts are going to be elected by the 
the extreme wing of, of, of the two parties. And that's what we end up with is a, a, a legislature with no centrists, no bridge builders, no, no people uh, with any sort of, of constructive middle of the road approach. I mean, literally none. There are always a few, but they're in sure. such a minority that they don't have a voice. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bowes, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bowes Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest is former Indiana Supreme Court Justice and head of the Pan Am Games in 1987 and quite frankly, many other things, uh, Ted Bohm. We have reached the five questions portion of the podcast, which if you've never listened to one, we ask the same five questions of every guest. Are you ready? Sure, I guess. <laughs> what was your first job? Uh, well, I, apart from paper boy, it was as a bus boy at the Butler Student Union. What was your first concert? Pete Seeger. A, a, a name may, unknown probably to much of your audience. Is that waist deep and big muddy, Pete Seeger? He's, 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 uh, uh, well, late he's a 60s, mid to late 60s. Uh, well, I heard him in the fifties at Brown. That's where I heard him. Yeah, that's a first. <laughs> if you could recommend, if you could suggest any book for someone to read any book, which book would you recommend? Only one. Well, I guess. I guess my reaction is the Encyclopedia Britannica, if you have to pitch one. <laughs> that is a great stuff. answer. That is, that is the first time we've heard anything like that. <laughs> Number four, if you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? I, I guess the, the uh, Constitutional Convention uh, of in, uh, 1787. Finally, if you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record, just to chat, whom would you choose? Barack Obama. Now that's been a very popular answer and deservedly so. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, or maybe more than once on this podcast, I reach out to Justice Bohm's friends. A lot of them you know they've appeared on this podcast or you've read about them and their amazing work and at the end of every podcast i try to sum up what i believe is the person's contribution uh, not only to the city and state but to our community uh, in this instance i'm going to read one and i'm not going to uh, embarrass your friend who sent it to me but this is what he sent when i reached out robert Ted is one of those selfless individuals that did most of the brain work for the forming of the Indiana Sports Corporation and any number of other organizations, events, and or activities that established Indianapolis as a sports town. He also led some of the workforce development programs locally that resulted in federal programs such as the Kennedy Quail Act and was implemented across the nation. He is a remarkable individual and a remarkable talent. Ted Bohm, thank you very much for coming on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.